For this assignment, we're going to be looking at the Negro II movement and anti-colonialism political thought. We're going to have an understanding of these terms by the end of this particular assignment. You want to use the AP source worksheet. And we are also going to complete this chart for the two sources. We also have the themes, resistance, resilience, creativity, expression, and the arts as well as migration and the African diaspora. We're going to first start out with the Berlin Conference in the 1800s, treat this like a definition. And for the most part, what happens here is that the European powers outlined here are having a meeting known as the Berlin Conference because they are about to potentially go to war over Africa because according to this match, each, sec each European power has taken up a section, the French West African section, the Belgian Congo, the British and so on. So to prevent them from going to war over Africa, they decided that they are going to have a meeting without African consent and they are going to have an agreement as far as which European power is going to control a portion of Africa. The Negritude and Negrismo movements have some similarities. Both are looking at the African diaspora and they're recognizing that the transatlantic slave trade with the exodus to Central, North, and South America was definitely different depending on your experience as a slave, if you were under the rule of the British legislation and the racial policies with regard to the empire that you were a slave in. Both of these movements are looking at the liberation of black people. The Negritude movement is primarily looking at colonialism and the role that colonialism is playing in the 1930-1940 uh, experience of the African and not just in America but also globally. So they're starting to connect the dots. The Negrismo movement is in the Caribbean emerging and we kind of already addressed the issue of Latin Americans with a darker pigmentation part of the browning tendency which basically argued that the darker the Latino is especially in America, they are going to be viewed more or less as African-American first, uh, not necessarily based on where they're from. So there's going to be no difference between a Cuban uh, or a Puerto Rican who happens to be darker with regard to the Browning tendency. The Afro-Cuban, the Afro-Puerto Rican in America will be viewed as African-American. Amy Cesar is making that connection with regard to colonialism and arguing, as it says here, the racial ideologies underpin colonial exploitation. So what he's trying to argue here is that colonialism, depending on how you look at it, colonialism is all about one nation trying to take the resources of another, which means it's primarily economic. But the argument being raised here is going to be that race also plays a role. Uh, this is a, the question is it all about economics or is it about race now we already viewed this political cartoon and how uncle sam according to this cartoonist views the individuals after the spanish-american war that the united states is trying to assimilate as it says here the connection between these movements and their own critique of global capitalism and racism so this right here is the key part that they're trying to Start, they're starting to look at the role of capitalism on a global level and they're arguing that this also is about racism. It's not just always about profit, it's also about race. Here we have one of the required images for the AP framework that says this piece conveys strength, beauty, and protection and it mentions that there are five overlapping masks. One two, three, four, and five. Another image that is in the AP framework, as it mentions here, the Afro-Cuban. We already addressed that particular term. One of the leading artists of the Negrismo movement, and this is his piece, Land the Jungle. It reflects on the legacies of slavery and colonialism. So what they're looking at here, you know, from, from this point of view, is that slavery, as well as colonialism, We'll put slavery, colonialism. The one thing they both have in common 
this is a result of the European decision to go ahead and enslave Africans and to colonize Africa going back to that Berlin conference. We're going to start looking at source one and these are the questions you want to think about with your chart as you read source one. What makes this source an example of the negative movement? What historical events does the author mention? And why do you think the author mentions those historical events? And we have the first source here, Discourse on Colonialism by Amy Cesar. And he mentions a lot about civilization as he starts out. The fact is that the so-called European civilization, and the reason why he's using the so-called European civilization is because remember, the Europeans view Africa as the dark continent. They believe just through that particular belief system that they are superior in comparison to the African. We already talked about how Egypt was viewed as an example of high civilization according to the Europeans. So what he's doing here by this reference, he's so-called, you know, he's recognizing that they're the ones calling him. He's making a judgment about the European civilizations. And this reading is definitely going to make a lot of historical references and you have to be ready for this. Uh, here he mentions bourgeois. Bourgeois is a reference to Karl Marx and Karl Marx's idea that the bourgeoisie or the people who have the resources in comparison to the proletariats who are the workers and the bourgeoisie, you want to think of them as the have group, the group that has the resources, the upper class, uh, whereas the proletariat are the working. Uh, when Karl Marx wrote about communism, he argued that it was inevitable that the people of the lower class would overthrow the people of the higher. And if you can understand that, ultimately what these individuals are going to be arguing is that just like you might have a ruling class in any society, in this example, you might have a ruling class for the world. So you want to think about the world powers, the United States, um, some of those European states, depending on the time period, Germany, France, and Britain. And these, I guess, would be the bourgeois states. And what we know about the bourgeois states is they did take over Africa and did take over parts of Asia. So he's arguing here by using this term, you know, he's bringing up the ideas of Marxism. Here the author writes, what is serious is that Europe is morally, spiritually indefensible. So again, it's looking at Europe and the actions of Europe, whether it's through imperialism, colonialism, slavery, the Europeans view themselves as an example of high civilization. And he's questioning that particular logic. The col colonialists may kill in Indochina, torture in Madagascar, imprison in black Africa, crack down in the West Indies. How is this an example of high civilization if you are treating people in such a manner? If you have a racist poly policy that views the uh, inhabitants of a another society as inferior. I guess from your point of view, that would be an example of high civilization, but that doesn't necessarily mean that everybody is going to have that viewpoint. Since I've been asked to speak about colonization, and that's what this topic here is about, and civilization, let us go straight to the principal lie that is the source of all others, colonization and civilization. What makes a civilization? what makes colonization. According to the Europeans, you have to have certain requirements. You have to have a stable government, a strong military. We already looked at this in unit one as far as what is the European basis for civilization. And again, the author is challenging that particular logic. Just because you colonize another region does not make you better because at the end of the day, we're always talking about human beings. Down here, he talks about Cortez. He starts bringing up some of the um, conquistadors. And this is all a section about historical colonization, imperialism, where one civilization is trying to take over the resources of another. So the author here is, again, making the comparison between colonization and civilization. A civilization, let's say A, that has a government, military, whatever the European criteria happens to be. And here we have civilization B. If they take over this particular area, maybe they put in place their own form of government. And then the end result for the people of B, usually not going to be positive. 
we must study how colonization works to decivilize the colonizer, to brutalize him in the true sense of the word, to degrade him, to awaken him to buried instincts. Again, he's talking here about the colonizer and his argument here is that even though you have control over section B, you are going to become decivilized, which is not a reference to B, but actually A, because you engage in horrific acts, as he mentions here. A couple of things you want to recognize here is that he brings up the Nazis and he speaks extensively about the Nazis here. But then when you look at this section, I've talked a good deal about Hitler because he deserves it. He makes it possible to see things on a large scale and to grasp the fact that capitalist society at its present stage is incapable of establishing a concept of the rights of all men, just as he has proved incapable of establishing a system of individual ethics. So again, I would say Adolf Hitler, the Nazi party, the Third Reich, considered themselves to be an example of high civilization. And he's questioning that particular logic. He's arguing that what really would make you an example of high civilization is when you have a concept of the rights of all men or when you are establishing a system of individual ethics. Just going in in a military fashion and taking over section B does not necessarily mean that you've done anything good for humanity. It might mean that you've done something good for yourself and for your own people, but that necessarily is not an example of high civilization, according to the author. The author brings up more historical references here, China, Hitler, Christianity. The important part is down here, not one established writer, not one academic, not one preacher, not one crusader for the right and for religion, not one defender for the, of the human person. And that's key to understanding what this particular source is about. Because again, the colonist, the colonizer, is going to view themselves as a superior group in comparison to the group that they're taking over and colonizing. As we continue with the source, we see the reference once again to colonization. They prove that colonization, I repeat, dehumanizes even the most civilized man, the colonial activity. This is key because he is arguing here, and I'm going to bring this up again, A thinks they're superior to B, which justifies A colonizing B. And then he brings up this point. They prove that colonization, I repeat, dehumanizes even the most civilized man. So these victims here are going to be dehumanized as a result of the actions of this particular group, which is odd because from the start, this group already believes that this group is not human and they are in fact inferior according to their worldview, not the colonized, meaning this group. All right, we'll finish up with source one here. We wanna think about the chart. What makes this source an example of the negative movement? It's the reference to colonialism and the connections that are being made. That would be one of the things. What historical events the author mentioned? Plenty, way too many in my opinion. He mentioned Hitler, he mentioned China, and you probably can go on with this particular list. Why does the author mention historical events? Because he is trying to make the connection between the historic examples of colonialism, because this particular movement, again, is about looking at the role of colonialism and the impact that it has psychologically as well as physically on the society that is the victim of colonialism. We're going to move on to source two. Source two, the chart, these two questions here, because this is an interview. A little bit of background information, which we addressed a couple of classes ago, would be the role of Ghana and Kwame Nkrumah. So we already know that the European powers cut up Africa as a result of the Berlin Conference. But after World War II, as a result of the Atlantic Charter, San Francisco Charter, uh, you started to see the movement away from imperialism. And for the most part, the European powers were leaving Africa altogether, which meant Africa could be ruled by Africans. And Kwame Nkrumah is the first president of Ghana. And that is definitely something that is important.
because uh, this individual is definitely a uh, individual interested in uniting Africa. He created the OAU, the Org Organization on Africa Unity, and that's why King is showing up. So let's take a look at the interview. And the first thing that's mentioned here, I knew I knew I was coming to Ghana. I had a very deep emotional feeling. Think of the fact that the new nation was being born. And this is key right here, that this new nation is being born. Here they talk about King showing up. There's really not too much historically in this uh, source with regard to content. It's simply just the Q&A, not as com complicated historically as the prior source. Ghana will become a symbol of hope for hundreds and thousands of oppressed people all over the world. Notice how he mentions Africa and Asia. Why do they do that? Because they're starting to make a connection between colonized people, not just in Africa, but the world. And that the Europeans, as well as the Americas, are always the nations that are trying to utilize imperialism or colonialism and people of color are at the on the receiving end of those particular initiatives and foreign policy. I remember that in the prior slide they were talking about colonialism and how that was definitely something that's going to be a positive and giving hope. As he mentions here, hope for the situation in which you find yourself there, well, ourselves in America. So if the people of Ghana are going to start to experiencing freedom and democracy, can that be accomplished in America? And King's answer is, yes, it does. So King is making a connection between what's going on in Ghana to what could potentially happen in America. Do you think when you get back home, if people ask you, do you think you're ready? What would be your answer to a thing like this? King seems to definitely be ready, as he mentions here. And uh, ultimately what they're talking about is freedom and uh, freedom that is at this point being experienced by the people of Ghana and what can that provide as far as influence is concerned for other people who are victims of imperialism and people who are experiencing discrimination. This point of the source, it's about saying goodbye. They talk about profiting by the mistakes of the West. That seems to think that the West has definitely made a mistake by making the decision to colonize, which is the whole point that they're celebrating the decolonization of Africa, starting first with Ghana. What is important about decolonization and why is King happy? King is happy because Africa is getting away from the rule of Europe and is going to now be Africa for the Africans. What is important about decolonization is that the Africans will be able to govern themselves. This is another required image for the AP framework. Here we have Joe Lewis next to Fidel Castro. Fidel Castro is significant because he led a communist revolution in 1959 and seems to be somebody advocating for the proletariat, which seems to be the direction that this uh, movement is eventually going to go. They're going to start making a connection between the proletariats of a nation to the proletariats of the world and arguing that there is a global bourgeoisie as well as a global proletariat. Another required image with emphasis on Maya Angelou mentions here plays movies and televisions and the closure slide what is colonialism how did activists link colonialism to the experience of Africans globally you should have an understanding of the terms that are here and if you want to check your definitions feel free to use this particular slide 